For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen yea and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You may be seated. Father, as we come to this word this morning and as we see the abundant riches of your grace through Christ, All we can do is bow as we aim to bring you honor through the preaching of your gospel. Lord, there are no wise, educated, knowledgeable words that I can formulate in and of myself. Father, I am dependent upon your spirit to make this text known unto our hearts. Would you apply by your sovereign grace this morning and by your spirit, would you apply this word to our lives that we would honor you and live for you and make you known to a world that is in desperate need of your son, Jesus Christ. We bow before the truth of your word by your spirit in Christ. Amen. Uh, As I was, I have to make a quick point before we begin. You know, yesterday I was driving in my truck when it was 9,000 degrees outside, and for some reason I wanted to uh, keep the air conditioning off. I don't know why. But the song that came on the radio was America Beautiful. And there is several lines in that song that we just sang that is, uh, that that needs our attention. And I want to point them out to you. The first is one that's glaring. I think you would know that um, that these are applicable truths. The first the first line that I want to show you in this hymn on hymn 485 is is God shed His grace on thee. I mean that plea right there is something that should be on the foremost parts of our hearts and minds. God shed Your grace on us. We need your grace. We need your spirit. We need you to lead us. That's a plea from from God's people. But there is another line in here that I think that I need to point out. And it's in the third verse, in the beginning of the verse. It says, O beautiful, for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. Uh, I I messed that up. No, it's the second verse at the very end of the second verse. I'm sorry. Self-control, thy thy liberty in law. You say, well, what's so important about that? Well, we enjoy our liberty here in the United States, our freedom. And we realize that that freedom is not free. It, It came with a very 
uh, very dear cost to many of us in this room. Someone in our family has been affected by uh, giving their life at one point or another for the cause of freedom. But notice how that second verse at the end of the second verse said, thy liberty in law. The only way that you can have true freedom, true freedom doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want. True freedom means you do that which is right. That's what freedom means. That's what liberty means. Liberty doesn't give you a free pass to do anything and everything that comes to your mind and say, this is my freedom. No, freedom is doing that which is according to the law of God. And you, and you say, well, wait a minute, doesn't law, isn't law oppressive to me? No, law is actually conforming you to the character of God. I want you to notice something, that the Ten Commandments aren't there to be oppressive upon us. You know, the Ten Commandments there were given in love. The first tablet is given in the love of God. We are to love God with everything in our heart, soul, mind, with all of our strength. And the second tablet was given that we would love our neighbor. The first was given to love God. The second was to love our neighbor. And we live according to that, that law, the law of love. And we find then that not only does that reveal to us that we should love God with everything we have and we should love our neighbor with everything we have, but the Ten Commandments, the law of God, reveals to us the character and nature of God. So what does it mean to, to in liberty in thy law? It means to live in freedom to do that which is according to the character of God. We need to remember that. So how does someone come to know this? How do you know what it is, what it means to live according to the character of God? Well, first, you cannot do it without the Spirit of God. That's where the self-control comes in. Remember, what does the fruit of the Spirit teach us? Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verses 21 through 23, 24, 25. They say that the fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, meekness, temperance, self-control. The self-control comes by the Spirit of God dwelling within us. And, and you, the, the big question is then begged to be asked, how do people come to know this? This is what we're talking about today. We're talking about, if you're looking at your bulletin, you'll see that the title of today's message is Why Preach? Why Preach? And if you were looking at Facebook, you'll notice that there was another sermon title. If you were looking at my notes, you would read a third sermon title. If you were looking at my notes that I have in this book, you would find a fourth. But the question that is begged to be asked is why preach the gospel? What do we preach? Here at Pleasant Hill Bible Church, as long as I am breathing, I want you to know that I am committed to preaching Christ crucified. That is my number one mission, is to preach Christ crucified to you and to the world. That's the call. That's the call that God has placed upon my life. That is the call as to why I exist. That is your call as Christians is to exalt the name of the crucified Lord Jesus Christ. We live according to this crucified Christ, our Savior, who has risen again for our justification and given us newness of life by his Spirit. I want you to look at verse number 17 where Paul says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, to euaglizomai, that means to preach the good news, to herald the greatest news the world has ever known, that you can be set free from your guilt and sin. You can have eternal life through this good news of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Notice what else he says in verse number 17. Not with wisdom of words, 
lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What essentially Paul just said there was if I come into this and I begin to preach the gospel with a, with a mindset that I'm going to entertain you and that I'm going to bring you this oration of lovely speech and I'm going to engage your minds to think academ- a- 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 with an with a academia mindset, that I'm missing the picture. That it's not to be with the wisdom of words. It's, it's to be with, with the power of Almighty God, not as a, as a result of the preacher himself, but as the Spirit of God is coupled with the truth of God. I was speaking to a dear friend of mine here locally uh, who's pastoring a church here in Bedford, and, and he said that he had, been, he had begun in this whole pandemic thing where he's not really able to visit the people that he would be inclined to visit for the most part, but some he has. And he's, he said to me that he'd begun uh, converting the old cassette tapes into, into MP3, MP4 format where he was putting them online, the old cassette tapes from his church before he was the pastor there. And, and what he was doing was he was going back through the pages of history in his church, the, the 40 to 45 years that the church had actually been in existence. And, and he stumbled across the very first message preached by the very first pastor in his church and he said to me on the phone he said it was one of the most amazing sermons I've ever heard and he said this is how he began that message he said this pastor I don't even know who the guy's name was but but the man was listening to this sermon and he said that the very first words out of his mouth were this he said Quote, we are here to worship, we are here to evangelize, and we are here to preach Christ crucified. End quote. That's pretty simple. (laughs) That that pretty much encapsulates the reason why we gather as a church. Uh, Let me point out, too, that a simple church A healthy church is a very simple church, one fixated on the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That same pastor went on to say later in the message, he said, we are not here to gossip. We are not here to talk politics. We are not here to start a social club. We are here to preach Christ crucified. Oh boy. (laughs) <laughs> if we could sound that sentence out in the churches across the United States and around the world today, we would see a lot healthier churches. So I have to ask you the question here that I gathered this morning. Do, if, if I were to say to you, what makes a healthy church? Or if I were to say, do you desire a healthy church? I think everyone in this room would say, yes, of course I desire a healthy church. Who doesn't want a healthy church? And then if I were to ask you, how do you do it? If you want a healthy church, you desire a healthy church, how do you do it? I think we would get a a list of answers. I think we would hear, well, we should love one another, and that is true. And I think we would hear, well, we should not forsake the gathering of ourselves together, and I would agree with that. I think that we should not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. I think that we should make it the utmost priority to gather together on the Lord's Day. I think that's important. I think that if someone were to say, well, I think it's because we need to be unified, and then therefore we'll have a healthy church, I would say, yes, we need to be unified. But everything that you've just told me is the same thing that a major league baseball team will say. We should love each other. We should be unified. We should not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. So what makes a healthy church? Friends, allow me to point out to you that a healthy church is not marked by the music team. A healthy church is not marked by the programs that it has for the youth. A healthy church is not marked by the different gatherings that you can have throughout the year. A healthy church is marked by the preaching of the gospel. That's how you have a healthy church. So I want to point out three things to you today. These three things are, number one, the preaching of the gospel pleases God. The preaching of the gospel pleases God. Number two, the preaching of the gospel brings joy to to the church, to believers. 
The preaching of the gospel brings joy to believers. And thirdly, and the main point of this whole time together this morning, is that the preaching of the gospel is what makes a healthy church. And I want to show you how. First of all, we have to ask the question, well, what is preaching? Look, look at verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, take a pause. What Paul just did there was he is reminding us, remember what took place in the beginning of this chapter. Paul began in the verse nine verses, first nine verses, he began to exhort and praise the Corinthian church that they should be unified, that Christ Jesus should be their focus. Remember, he, he said uh, in nine verses, he used the word or term Jesus Christ nine times. And then in the remaining portions of the tra- chapter, we find that he continues to reiterate that Jesus Christ must be the focus. In verses 10 through 17, Paul points out that you can't have cliques and fractions in the church or it will be divided. Paul points that out. He says it's clear. If you expect to have a healthy church, there can't be divisions. And he goes as far as to tell us that divisions within the church are sinful. That they bring reproach to the name of Jesus. And now, in the latter half of this chapter, Paul begins to lay the foundation as to how to have a healthy church. And it begins, friends, here it's where it begins, It begins in verse number 18, for the word of the cross, or for the preaching of the cross, is to them that perish its foolishness, and unto us that are saved, it is the, here, I love these two, I love these three words, the preaching of the cross, the word of the cross, is the power of God. How remarkable and and, and invigorating is that truth. The preaching of the cross of Christ is, is the power of God. Notice something else. Still in verse 18. The preaching of the gospel divides. How? What is the only division that is acceptable unto God? Well, it's the preaching of the gospel because to those that are perishing, the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the cross, is is total foolishness. We're going to explore that a little bit more. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Notice what Paul does here now in verse 19. He says, for it is written, Paul in his expert writing, he looks back to the Old Testament. He's quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 29. He's quoting from there and Isaiah says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? (laughs) You gotta love how Paul writes I love this verse number 20. <laughs> he says, for where, where is the wise? Where's the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You know what he just did there? He says, show me, where is the wise man? Where's the one who, who comes into Corinth and makes an orientation, makes a speech, and invigorates you with his expert knowledge and his, his swelling words? Where's the, where's the one that came to you in this, in this wonderful, beautiful language who would speak in front of thousands of crowds? He would be the disputer of the times. Where's the one that was writing down the stars and contemplating philosophy? In, in a very real sense, Paul is saying, where's Aristotle? Where's Plato? Where are these men who said that they claim to know everything there is to know about this life? Oh yeah, that's right. They're dead. Paul is making a point here. He's saying all the philosophizing and all of the education that you can grab in this world with the worldly wisdom that you can gather, you will never be able to defeat the one and glaring question in a man's life. What do you do with death? You can write books upon books. You can have stacks and stacks of degrees. But if you can't answer the question, what do you do with death? You have nothing. That's what Paul's pointing out. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer? Oh yeah, that's right. They're dead. And and if they are alive today, Paul is pointing out, they will be dead. 
And Paul is making an important note for us to catch. The question that he asks in the end of verse number 20 is, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it, here's the first point, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Paul is clearly pointing out that, look, you know what God did in his infinite wisdom? He, he, he sent his son, his only begotten son, born of a virgin, living a sinless life, died a sinner's death upon a sinner's torturous cross in, as a substitute for his people. He was laid in a borrowed tomb for three days and on the third day. Here's how God made in his infinite wisdom, he made foolish the wisdom of the world. Because in God's infinite wisdom, he rose a dead man from death unto life. And the world says, nah, dead men stay dead. The wisdom of the world teaches that once you're dead, that's it. There's nothing more. Nothing less, but the wisdom of God says, I have raised my son. And your forgiveness, and your salvation, and your life is hid in him alone. God has taken in his infinite wisdom, God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. And how does he, here's, here it goes back to the original question that I was asking you. How does the world come to know this? by the preaching of the gospel. It's by the preaching of the gospel. Notice what, it pleased God, verse 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. (laughs) It is kind of a funny thing that we would gather here as a body of believers, that you would come and you would, would take your seat and we would worship together singing the truth of the word of God, singing the truth of the gospel, right? That's what we do. Our music should be so saturated with the truth of God that it is as we are exalting him and singing about him that we are praising him because we are praising him through the gospel. But this, it's kind of a funny thing. You've got a guy in front of you with a book, and he's exhorting you. He's teaching you. He's admonishing you. He's grabbing you by the heart, and he's saying, you must do something about this. Tell me one place in the entire world where something like this exists. It doesn't. A theater? A theater? This is not a calculated speech that I'm giving to you. I am exhorting you with the truth of God's word. There's nothing like this in the world. A healthy church is built upon the preaching of the gospel. Now, so what is, what is preaching? We, we want to look at this word in verse number 21. By the way, I've pointed out to you in verse number 17 that to preach the gospel, that's the euanglizomai, that means to exalt or herald the good news of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 18, Paul uses another word for preaching. Instead of the word preaching, he uses the word logos, which means word, the word of the cross. And in verse number 21 and 23, we see another word for preach. It means to herald. I want you to picture something. In ancient times, when a king would go and take his army into a foreign land and defeat the enemy, he would be gone on that military campaign for several years. And as he was gone for several years and he came back into his city victorious, he would come with an entourage leading the way. The parade would begin. People would be coming out ahead of the king. You wouldn't send the king into the city first. You would send the heralds. You would send the ones that would storm into the streets and say, the king is coming, the king is coming. He is victorious. Exalt the king. 
That's what the herald would do. He would, he would come and he would shout the good tidings of the coming king. And then in the beauty, in the pageantry, the king upon his white horse with the flower petals falling down from the high buildings and the people in the streets shouting, Hooray, the king is here! Victorious is the king! The king would walk into his city victorious. That's what the preacher does. The preacher says the king has come. The king is victorious. Your life is hid in the king. Believe. Repent of your sins. Trust in this king. So the preaching is meant to do something. I want to give you four things that preaching is meant to do. Preaching is number one, as we've seen in verse number 20, preaching is meant to glorify God. It's the primary focus of preaching. All week long, I, I pray, Lord, may you be glorified. Would I not exalt anyone in the pew? Would I not exalt myself? But that you would be glorified. Glorify your name through the preaching of your word. That's number one. Number two, what is preaching meant to do? What, this is an element that preaching must have. If you go to another church and preaching doesn't have any of these four things, that's not a New Testament church. Preaching must inform the mind. All preaching is teaching, not all teaching is preaching. And we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that in in. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, with the application and the power of the Spirit accompanying the preaching of the Word. But preaching must inform the mind. Preaching must, must educate you about the truth of Jesus Christ, namely that he came, he lived a sinless life, he is the Son of God. He died in the place of sinners, was buried and resurrected again. That is the information that is being conveyed through preaching. Number two, or excuse me, number three. Number three, that preaching must have, preaching must exhort your heart. I'm talking not, I'm not just data dumping. I'm not just giving you information upon information upon information. I'm saying, this is the king victorious, and Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I'm talking to your heart. I'm saying you must feel this in your heart that he came for you. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He left the 99 to chase the one. I'm talking to your heart. And fourthly, preaching must challenge the will. And this is this is tricky. This is, it must have application. You must be able to take the word of God, coupled by the spirit of God, and apply it to your life. Preaching must challenge your will. And check it out. Preaching always feeds the sheep of God. And it gives the goats of God indigestion. So something happens. Either you leave here and you are angry, as my third grade English teacher would say to us, rip, snorting, mad. Or you are rejoicing in the wonders of Jesus Christ the Lord. That's what preaching the gospel does. Either, And it, there's the dividing line. That's why the word is called the sword, because it divides. The preaching of the gospel to them that are perishing is complete foolishness. But to us who are saved or being saved, it is the power of God. It is our greatest joy. It is what we live for. We live to hear of the King of Kings because we love Him and He is whom we worship. I have no idea where I am here. This is where we need to be. Look at verse number 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. 
unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So, uh, I have to make a point here, a point of application, because what we're, what we're looking at is that God has just told us that the wisdom of God is Jesus Christ. I've had people, and, and, and I feel so humbled and uh, inadequate whenever these questions come to me. They come and they don't know what to do with their children. Their children are unruly and they don't know how to handle it. And, and they don't know how to be a better parent or they don't know how to be a better wife or they don't know how to be a better husband or, or these, these things are going on in their lives that have them challenged in their hearts as to what to do. So they have these questions, well, how do I strengthen my marriage? How do I become a better husband? How do I become a better father? And here, I mean, these people have been married for years and, and, or parents for much longer than I have, and they come to me with these questions, and, and, and I, have, I have a sense of inadequacy because the answer cannot come from me. So how do you have this guy who, let's face it, is the youngest man in this church? How do you have a young man such as, so was Timothy. How do you have a young man who has not been experienced in the challenges of life, how do you bring him to be the pastor of a church? Because i got to be honest with you, every morning, every Sunday morning when I wake up, I feel like I should just climb behind this pulpit. And just... Do you know how? It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with an almighty Savior. I can't help you, but I know someone who can. So I want to tell you about him, because he is the wisdom of God, and he is the power of God. How do you become a better father? You become more like Jesus. How do you become a better husband? You become more like Jesus. How do you lead your children who are unruly and they hate God? You become more like Jesus. I've got no other answers for you. To be honest with you, anything else that I give you is just trash. But for me to point you to him, he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Christ, verse 24, Christ the power of God. Christ the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser, verse 25, than man, the, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You need to remember that. That the weakness of God is infinitely stronger than every man on this planet combined. <laughs> when we turn on the news and we feel like everything's coming unraveled and we don't know what to do and we're, it seems like mankind is getting the upper hand and we see these pictures of Jesus weeping. Friends, you need to know that God Almighty is stronger than man. <laughs> I was reading about Samson this morning. And I was reading in Judges, chapters 13 and 14, and, and, and Samson, like we, get the, we like to read about Samson because Samson's a strong guy, you know? He's the one that's, that's the judge of Israel that was very strong. Do you know that he was physically strong, but he was spiritually very weak? Very weak. When it came to temptation, Samson caved every time. He tells the Philistines a riddle, 
the Philistines work through his wife who comes to him and gets it out of him what the answer of the riddle is. And, and, and as she goes and tells her people who she is more loyal to than her own husband, Samson says, if you wouldn't have plowed with my heifer, that's a pretty frightful terminology. Then he goes and kills 30 people. But I want you to see something in verse number 26. For ye see your calling. Now this is where I want you to know that you, Christian, this is not just the preacher. Verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many, not many noble are called. It's not many wise, not many noble, not many of these men who are educated beyond their intelligence, not many of these people who are born into the noble, kingly lines of man-centered history, but God delights in using nobodies. He delights in using people who will be submissive to him, that will, will be following his son no matter what, that will take up their cross and follow him. You see your calling, brethren, the calling of the gospel. It's not with many wise men after the flesh. It's not with many mighty but verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. There's the mission. The preaching of the gospel will, conf will continue to seal off those who are the, the worldly mindset, those who will not be saved, those who consider that the preaching of Jesus Christ is foolish. The preaching of the gospel will further blind them and confound their minds. But God has chosen, verse 27, the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. God has chosen Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things which are. God chose. This is, this is amazing. I want you to see something that is so very clear. Because the entirety, the entirety of what I'm telling you tonight, this morning, what day is it? No. Verse 30, look at the beginning of verse 30. I know we're not there yet, but I want to point out something to you. Because if you're going to hear anything else I tell you this morning, I want you to hear this sentence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. Now, what we've been studying is God has chosen preaching, preaching of the gospel. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise in this world. God has chosen the weak things of this world. God has chosen the despised things of this world. Do you see what God is doing? He is showing you, look, check this out. I want you to see something here because this will be revolutionizing your, this will be taking the blinders off of our Christianity. We are this is taught all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the scriptures. We are chosen from before the foundation of the world in the Father. We are redeemed, purchased, forgiven in the Son. We are born again by the Spirit of God. Where are you in there? Do you know what you brought to your salvation? The sin that made it necessary. From eternity past in the Father, purchased by the Son on the cross, born again by the Spirit of God. And friends, that's scriptural. That's what the Bible teaches. And that is what we preach. Because in verse number 30, but of him are you in in Christ Jesus. You're not in, then out another day. <laughs> Just make a little side point here. These, these churches and these preachers, man. These preachers that get up in front of people and say that you can lose your salvation. Do you have any kind of idea what kind of burden that would be for me to tell you that? Because you'd go in day in and day out. Am I saved today? I messed up yesterday. 
Maybe I should come back to the altar and recommit myself for the 300th time. I, if, I were to, if I were to hang that weight upon your neck, I'd be, I'd be, I would be selling you into slavery. That's not what Christ did. If the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. Now I have to close here because our time is going so quickly and it drives me crazy, that clock. But Yesterday I was reading about a man, I better not get too close, social distancing, and I know that six feet is not enough for a preacher who gets excited, okay? You might, anyway. Yesterday I was reading about a man by the name of Billy Sunday. Anybody know who Billy Sunday is? What a guy. I mean, we, we know who Billy Graham is. Well, Billy Sunday was the predecessor of Billy Graham. <laughs> Billy Sunday, this is very interesting, he was born during the Civil War. One month after he was born, Billy Sunday's father died in the war. Now, you thought maybe he would get wounded or something, but he actually was crossing a river. He got pneumonia and he died. But that was a month after Billy was born. He never met his father, his real father, his real father. A couple months later, a couple years later, not shortly thereafter, his mother remarried a man who eventually left. So his mother couldn't take care of him and his siblings and his brothers, and Billy Sunday was sent to an orphanage in Missouri, in Indiana. He was sent to an orphanage in Indiana. And there, Billy Sunday, at eight years old, was on his own. He was on his own. I mean, he went from being under his mother's care. His mother said, I can't take care of you. By the way, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of children who were found to be orphans during the Civil War, and these orphans were found to be on their own in eight, nine, ten years old in these orphanages, where hundreds, it was said that in one cottage that we would consider to be, most of us live in homes that are average-sized homes. These average-sized homes are the same size as the cottages in Indiana where Billy Sunday was, with 150 children living in one building. It was while he was in the orphanage that he was discovered to be quite the athlete. Billy Sunday was a fast kid. He was drafted into the Chicago White Stockings in the early 1900s because he was fast. It was said that no one up until that point was stealing bases more than Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday could make it from a stop at home plate around all bases and back to home in 14 seconds. He was a ball player. I was never a ball player, but listening to Billy Sunday makes me want to go play some baseball, especially near the 4th of July. But there, Billy Sunday was a, was a major league star. He ruled Chicago. And if you were a ball player in Chicago, friends, you were known around the world. But something happened to Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was sitting on the street corner in Chicago with his baseball buddies, drunk as a skunk sitting on the curb, and out come this group of men and women coming out of the local mission singing hymns, singing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They come out of this local mission. They've just been worshiping the Lord inside this local building, and Billy Sunday's there, drunk as a skunk on the street corner, and he hears the gospel being sung. Billy, Billy Sunday went to a, an evangelistic meeting by another big-name guy in Chicago, D.L. Moody. There, Billy Sunday committed his life to Christ, was born again in a supernatural way, left off the drinking, left off the carousing, committed his life to Jesus Christ. He was born again, and he went on to become the greatest evangelist in the early 1900s, if not during the entire 20th century. And there came a point where Billy Sunday had to say, it's either going to be ball or serving the Lord. 
And without a doubt, Billy Sunday left off all the fame and riches of playing baseball to become an evangelist. It's been said that 7,000 people came to Christ at one of his meetings. Throughout the 20, while the time that Billy Sunday was preaching and, and active as an evangelist, it's been said that 1.5 million people came to know the Lord in the first 35 years of the 20th century because of Billy Sunday. Now, what am I telling you all this for? Because if you go home and you look up who Billy Sunday is and you watch three seconds of his preaching, you would say if that man was the pastor of this church, he would be fired. Because he was a fire-breathing, devil-punching, spitting preacher. And the thing of it was, and what I mean by this is that not many mighty, not many noble, Billy Sunday came from nothing. And the Lord raised him up to use him in a manner. He didn't come with this expert speech. He didn't come with these pages upon pages of notes. He had seven sermons and he preached the word of God. He could speak to the common person. He could speak right to their heart. And he led millions to the Lord. God delights in using nobodies. But, Billy Sunday turned from a major league baseball career. So I have a question for you. What has God been calling you to do that maybe you might be a little bit too attached to that's keeping you from serving him in the capacity that he wants to? Second question, is the preaching of the gospel central to your Christian life? Because if the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is central to your Christian life, it will become central to this church. And if it becomes central to this church, we will be a healthy church used in a mighty way by the Lord. And that's what every preacher desires. I'll leave you with a story from Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers. This is what happens whenever we... You all know who Adrian Rogers is, right? Adrian Rogers, I think he's since gone home to be with the Lord, but he told a story once about a woodpecker. He said this woodpecker was, well, woodpecking on a tree. And as he was hammering away on this tree, a bolt of lightning came down and struck the tree that this woodpecker was pecking in, and it split the tree in half. And the woodpecker flew away and not too that long after, he came back with the nine of his buddies. And he said, look what I did. <laughs> so often, the reason I say that is because so often we forget that we're nothing. And that really we're just making a whole bunch of racket. It's the Lord who does the work. Let's remember that it's not many mighty, it's not many noble, but that he that glories, verse 31 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly King, thank you for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. We are so prideful. We forget that it's you. It's all you. Anything good in us is you. Thank you for rescuing us from the fires of hell. Challenge us to live for you this week. Protect these that are gathered here that they would live for you every moment of their lives. Heal our land, Lord. Heal our nation. Turn us to your gospel. Bring us together, Lord. We trust in you and you alone. Through Christ Jesus, my Lord, amen.